Hey everyone, it's Michael. Today I'm bringing you another bonus update episode. In this one, I'm going to continue the conversation that I had with author and filmmaker Jesse Pollock a couple of months ago, when the news about Shannon Gilbert's case broke from Suffolk County, New York. If you recall, authorities there released the audio and transcript from her panicked 911 calls to police early on the morning of May 3rd, 2010. Audio that they had been fighting tooth and nail against releasing for the better part of a decade, defying several court orders in the process. Jesse and I last spoke about this case back in May, and recorded our conversation very last minute. I think I had my daughter sitting on my lap throughout, so it was kind of difficult to talk about everything we needed to. We promised to continue our discussion in a week or so after that, but life has just gotten in the way for the both of us. So we had about an hour this past week and decided to finally jump on a call to talk about how we had gotten involved in the case and our current frustrations with this story, primarily as it pertains to Shannon Gilbert herself. Hello everyone and welcome to another update episode of the Unresolved Podcast. I am your host Michael Whelan and joining me again is my friend. You may know him, he's a journalist, he's an author, he's a filmmaker. He does everything. His name is Jesse Pollock. Yeah, I do everything except drive uh, manual. I never figured that one out. Hey, you're not alone. <laughs> We're millennials, okay? <laughs> all, the, all the gearheads in high school, they would never let me live that down. But here we are. Um, yep. and you'll have to forgive the, the, the sort of, uh, jokey tone. Um, we're trying to get, a uh, in the right headspace to, to talk about this cause, uh, it's a dark story. It's yep. still unresolved. Um, there's a lot of tragic circumstances involved, but, uh, I mean, you, you clicked the title of the episode. So, you know, we're here to finally talk about how Michael and I became involved in the, investigation into the Long Island serial killer case, uh, specifically the death of Shannon Gilbert. Yes. Yeah. Um, you and I talked about it briefly a couple of months ago when the news broke that Suffolk County was releasing the transcript and the audio of Shannon Gilbert's her you know, her infamous panicked 911 call. And uh, at the end of that conversation, you know, I recorded that with my daughter sitting on my lap the entire time. <laughs> yeah, it was just kind of like a, a last minute, almost like emergency recording. We just wanted to get something out. And uh, we told you all that we were going to be coming back in, you know, a week or so. And it's been a couple of months, but life has just kind of gotten in the way for both of us. And uh, we just wanted to finally put something out there and kind of talk about how you and I both got involved in that story. Yeah, because a, a lot of things have happened. We've been prepping work on a horror film that we are going to be shooting in the fall. We both have families. Uh, I've got um, an updated and revised edition of Death on the Devil's Teeth, the book I co-wrote with Mark Moran about the Ginetta Palma case. That is coming at the end of September, along with the documentary film that you and I worked on with Dan Jones and a lot of the uh, the people over at Podcast 1289. Um, that's The Acid King, our documentary mm -hmm. about the Ricky Casso case. That is coming out the same week, so... It's been very busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got yeah. a lot of irons in the fire, but we're finally here. Um, I guess we're just going to go into the background here, uh, how we came to be involved in mm -hmm. this end of the story. And this isn't like bragging rights for Michael and I. We just kind of wanted to be transparent about yeah. just trying to like clear the air. You know, yeah. so we didn't seem like we were opportunist just trying to like jump in there because I, I personally I felt really bad, you know, when the story broke, it kind of happened with no warning. You know, Suffolk County let everyone know pretty much the night before that they and were going to be not... releasing this 911 call. And yeah, like you're about to say, they didn't even inform the family of Shannon Gilbert. Mm -hmm. Not a phone call, nothing, not before, yeah. during or after. Yeah. And we know that because we have been work we had been working with the Gilbert family uh through their attorney John Ray um ever since July 2020, which was when we were brought on board to analyze, uh, clean up and transcribe the not just the 911 calls um made by Shannon. But the 911 calls made by Gus Coletti, Barbara Brennan, and Joseph Brewer. Mm -hmm. And that all came about in a, 
just I don't want to say a random way, but basically I have a background in audio engineering, which is one of the reasons why I'm also a podcaster, uh, in addition to being an author and a journalist. Uh, I was trained at the Institute of Audio Research in New York City back in 2007, um, and I do the audio production work on all of the podcasts that Michael and I appear on outside of Unresolved. And I had come across a Facebook post, I believe it was, but basically it was sharing a GoFundMe link for the Gilbert family. It was John Ray had gotten access to the 911 recordings either that year or the year before, but he was not allowed to, I mean, forget show them to the press. He wasn't even allowed to show them to the Gilbert family. Yeah, the people he was representing as a lawyer, which is just yeah. kind of crazy. After years and years and years of badgering them and court orders that had gone ignored for years, the Suffolk County Police Department finally gave John Ray those recordings, but said they're just for you. Mm -hmm. They're for your ears only, and it's for you, you know, basically to prep for your casework um, in this, because I believe there is ongoing litigation um, against Dr. Charles Peter Hackett, one of mm -hmm. Ray's suspects in this case. And if you haven't already listened to Michael's three-part series on the Long Island serial killer, please turn this recording off, this episode off, and go and not only listen to those three episodes, but the subsequent update episodes that have been released since mm -hmm. then. Because it's not just yeah. the Shannon Gilbert recording, Michael, but you did episodes uh, when Valerie Mack was identified, right? Yes, yeah. When they released the, uh, the Valerie Mack's identity and then also when they released uh, the belt, like the belt buckle or whatever that was, the piece of evidence mm -hmm. that they tried to, you know, when they announced the the big reveal of the website. But uh, yeah, most of my updates have actually been regarding uh, Shannon Gilbert's 911 call in particular, because mm -hmm. over the years, you know, John Ray and other advocates have been trying to get that audio released. And Suffolk County at one in one hand is saying Shannon Gilbert wasn't a victim of the Long Island serial killer. She has no involvement. She died accidentally. And then... In the other hand, they're saying, we can't release this audio because it's inherently a part of our case. I don't know. That always felt very hypocritical to me, very like having their cake and eating it too. And it's um, nonsensical. It's, yeah, it just it's, doesn't make any sense just on its face. So it's either Shannon Gilbert died accidentally or you're investigating her death. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so and, this and audio has always just been like very... I don't know, very important to me in the coverage of this case because it kind of highlights why people are mad at Suffolk County for their handling of it. Exactly. And it's, I mean, if any of you listeners are familiar with my work, um, either through the Devil's Teeth podcast or the book Death on the Devil's Teeth, you know that I'm no stranger to police departments saying, yeah, you're technically entitled to these files, but we're not going to give them to you. Because you didn't ask the, the, the right way, um, you know, through a Freedom of Information Act request or, um, oh, yeah, we would give them to you, but the tapes and records you're requesting, they're missing. So, mm. I mean, and Michael, I'm sure you've encountered roadblocks like that through your research work for the oh, episodes yes. you've recorded. Yeah, it, mm. it could be pulling teeth sometimes. Other times, it's incredibly easy when i was working on the ricky casso case the strange thing is, is the suffolk county police department the same suffolk county police department that is in charge of the long island serial killer investigation gave me pretty much everything i asked for um regarding the murder of gary lowers by ricky casso crime scene mm -hmm. photos uh confessions paperwork everything they were incredibly transparent there now, of course, one could say, well, that was a closed case that you're discussing. But again, it's 
it was an example that made it all the more frustrating. It's, wow, they're being so transparent about this one, but why aren't they being transparent about this supposedly meaningless 911 call? And Mm -hmm. it's a similar thing that I experienced again with the Jeanette Palma case. The police, especially the retired police in Union County, New Jersey, will say, oh, well, no, you know, she was, she probably wasn't even murdered. She was probably just some hippie who overdosed in the woods. Oh, okay, well, if she was just some hippie that overdosed in the woods and it was a natural and accidental death, can I see the case file? Absolutely not. It took me nine and a half years to get that case file released through about a dozen Freedom of Information Act requests. And we're Mm -hmm. talking changes of administration within the Union County Prosecutor's Office. So I completely understand um, the sort of teeth pulling if you will that john ray's office has had to go through and when they finally got the recordings again it was with the caveat of you may not release these publicly so this gofundme link was basically the gilbert family asking the public listen we want to get these recordings because they are not of the highest quality at all we are talking Mm -hmm. and by the way they're not tapes um they're always referred to as the shannon gilbert tapes but these were recorded digitally by the suffolk county police department and the new york state police yeah Um, and i'm pretty sure the version that john ray had it was basically like a copy of a copy of an mp3 so it's you know just digitally degraded oh yeah and they're of an incredibly low bit rate because you got to You know, you have to put it into perspective how many hours of audio, probably all 24 hours of the day, every minute of every one of those 24 hours is recorded by these 911 operators, of which there are many. So you're talking about hundreds of hours of collective audio for a single day. You know, forget tapes, digital data, that adds up quickly so they record these usually in a low bit rate to save space Mm -hmm. so because these recordings were not of a high quality by any standards um the gilbert family and john ray's office wanted to get them cleaned up and analyzed as best as best as possible to see if not only was there anything that was missed by the investigators, but were there other people in the background? Like when I eventually spoke with Ray, that was his big concern. He wanted to know if there were other people there at that house that were not mentioned as the official story. And again, the official story is the only people that were in that house that night were Joseph Brewer, Shannon's client that Mm -hmm. night, Shannon herself and her driver, Michael Pack. Now, a lot of people have theorized over the years that these tapes were not being released because their pet suspect, in their theory, they're either mentioned on the tapes or they are actually present on the tapes. And I won't lie, that was my theory when I was a young man. This case broke when I was in my very early 20s, and I followed it since day one, Mm -hmm. and I mean, for the longest time, I would half jokingly tell people, oh, yeah, they're not releasing the 911 tapes because uh, James Burke is mentioned on Mm -hmm. them, the disgraced police chief. Yeah. Um, And I actually feel kind of bad about that because I feel like when I released my episodes back in 2016, I basically dedicated one episode to just I I just wanted to talk about like the corruption that was going on in Suffolk County at the time. Mm-hmm. But I feel like a lot of people, like especially on Reddit and Web Sleuths, they kind of like they took what I was saying and tried to make it seem like I was, I don't know, accusing James Burke of being the killer. But I feel like over time, over the past, you know, however long it's been, six years, people have kind of morphed that into James Burke was there. There was like a sex party going on. There were like a bunch of other people around. But I feel like that wasn't there wasn't really any proof of that. It's just, you know, there was a suspicion that other people were there. And I feel like that's what John Ray really wanted to get to the bottom of. Um, I had seen in this uh, Facebook post that they needed this money because the, the I don't know if it, uh, firm would be a good word, but the, the specialists that they were thinking about hiring to clean up these recordings we're charging upwards of six grand. 
And I saw that, and, and listen, everybody has a right to be compensated for their work, and everybody's got a right to eat, but I felt yeah. that it was kind of disgusting that people were trying to profit off of the pain and suffering of a family that has already gone through so much. For those of you yeah, who that don't just know, wants resolution, that's all they really want. Like, Yeah, they're not, you know, people talk about, oh, well, they've had two movies made about them. Listen, the Gilbert family largely is not happy with those films. They, they were not compensated for them. They were not part of the making of those films. Like, you know, that, that is not them out there trying to cash in on the death of Shannon. You know, these things are based on books that have been written about them or based on magazine articles. That's got nothing to do with them. So they were not asking for this stuff for, you know, more fame and notoriety. They just want these answers, like Michael just said. And I just didn't think it was right, especially after they had to crowdfund Shannon's grave. Like yeah. they, these these are normal working salt of the earth people who are of limited means. They couldn't even afford to bury the girl for yeah. the longest time. Shannon Gilbert was arguably the most famous murder victim, at least the most, you know, talked about murdered victim for several weeks, maybe even months mm -hmm. in America. And her own family couldn't afford to bury her. So, yeah, and that's without going into, you know, all the personal issues that they've had as a family. Like a lot of oh people, you may not know that Mary Gilbert, Shannon's mom, was killed by one of Shannon's sisters. And, you know, the sister was suffering from her own mental issues. So, you know, they just have a lot going on. And yeah, when you saw the post from John Ray, their lawyer, basically crowdfunding money to clean up this audio, you decided to kind of take it upon yourself. And, and, you know, there are those out there that might say, well, why doesn't John Ray uh, pay for this? John Ray has been working pro bono for the Gilbert family for nearly a decade now. The only way that he has profited from this case is just exposure through being in newspaper articles and on the occasional documentary appearance. Like, he's not lining his wallet with the Gilbert family's money and asking them for more. He's literally representing them for free and knows that they are of limited means. So crowdfunding was the only option because this firm was trying to charge them upwards of six grand. I saw that and I didn't think that was right. Um, in a million years, did I think that they would actually respond to me? No, but I I wouldn't have been able to forgive myself if I didn't offer up like, hey, you know, and this is what I wrote in the email. I said, I'm sure you have other people offering to do this, but I do have experience cleaning up audio. I, you know, was trained at the Institute of Audio Research. I am also a journalist that is familiar with the case. I've been following it for years. Um, as a journalist, I am no stranger to having to sign confidentiality agreements. Um, if you need someone to do this, I will do it for free. I don't even want the credit for it because, mm -hmm. you know, this is a huge case and I don't want to come off as just trying to further my name. I just wanted to help. And so for two years, we kept it a secret, Michael, that mm -hmm. you, me and, and our friend Jeff had worked on this. Yeah. And after John got the email, I heard back from him. I want to say it was about two or three days later and he said, well, call me, let me, uh, you know, talk to you and we'll discuss this. So we discussed a multitude of things, what he was looking to be done with the tapes. Again, like I mentioned before, he wanted them cleaned up to see if there was anything that was missed by the police and if there were other people in the house that night. Um, in addition to that, we talked about our backgrounds and, you know, again, parallels here like I said before, this is the same Suffolk County where the Castle case happened. John Ray uh, used to play, I think he said it was tennis or racquetball with Ricky Casso's parents back in the 70s. He oh, said, wow. oh, yeah, I remember that case. I knew their parents. So worlds Holy colliding. Cow, small world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think because I had worked on that case as a journalist prior to this, John Ray knew, oh, okay, well, he's he's familiar with the area. You know, he knows the dynamics. He's familiar with 
the Suffolk County Police Department and how they work. So I think he felt he could trust me there. And mm -hmm. so I told him, I said, well, listen, I have a few other people that I have in mind to bring aboard on this, if only so we can fact check each other. And I had mentioned you and I had mentioned our friend Jeff, who we also podcast with. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff was trained by the FBI's criminal lab in yeah. a lot of um, computer techniques, stuff like that. A lot of stuff we can't go into on the show. Yeah, because and a lot of good just law enforcement experience. Exactly. And he was also very familiar with the case as well. And yeah. I figured this would be a team of people that are not only trained in computer work, audio work, and investigatory work. It's three people that have been familiar with because this cast of characters in this case is a mile long. This is a story that if you if you want to believe that the bodies in Manorville are, you know, it's the same serial killer. This case goes all the way back to the mid nineties. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different players. Yeah. So I felt it was important for a team to be put together and not just one person, you know, possibly falling victim to confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. So John Ray approved it. Uh, we signed confidentiality agreements and uh, Jeff got to work Um getting the files transferred from Ray's office to the three of us. And we spent Michael, what was it about two months cleaning up the tapes and then, uh, transcribing yeah. them. Yeah. It was probably about like, yeah, two, three months. Uh, cause you know, we were all doing it. It was the middle of the pandemic, but we were all still working. So we had mm -hmm. to just plan it around, you know, working. I think at the time I was planning to move from Virginia to Alaska. So that was also a consideration on my part, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it was just first cleaning up the audio, and then after that we got work transcribing. And I think what we did is we just kind of assigned portions to each other, and then afterward we would just kind of go through and check what everyone had done and see if everything matched up. Yeah, and I think we really did good work because there were only maybe three or four sections where we weren't in 100% agreement with each other at first with what we heard, but then we eventually worked together on it and we all signed off on our transcript together. Mm -hmm. And I believe this transcript, now this is just a personal belief. I have no, um, you know, uh, independent verification of this, but I believe our transcript is the one that is currently being used by the Suffolk County police department and the FBI. And I believe this for two reasons. One, I recognized phrasing, um, in the presentation that the Suffolk County Police Department did during the press conference when they released these tapes. I noticed language that was unique to our transcript um, in the notation, mm -hmm. in the sidebars, stuff like that. And also, John Ray told me that through his work on this case, it was, I believe, confirmed to him that the Suffolk County Police Department never made their own transcript of these recordings. They apparently yeah, listened wow. to them a couple times and threw them in a drawer somewhere. Wow. That, I mean, I wish I could say it's surprising. It's really not, but that's still, you know, however long it had been, like 12 years, 11 years. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Well, you know, the Suffolk County Police Department, Michael, they're a small police department. They only have hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars at their disposal <laughs> they can't be expected yeah, I mean, to hire an intern to transcribe a, a 24 minute tape yeah there's no money on long island yeah can't yeah, do that none. <laughs> <laughs> but um i mean the criticism of how this case was handled is you know a whole other rabbit hole mm -hmm. but that was how we were brought in and that is what we prepared for John. And since the 911 call from Shannon, the one from uh, Gus Coletti, and yeah, the Gus one Coletti. from yeah. and Barbara Brennan's 911 call, those have been made public. So that mm -hmm. portion of our confidentiality agreement with John Ray's office, I believe, I think it's it's fair game for us to talk about that now. The tapes are public. The only yeah. thing that we worked on that has not been publicly released, at least as of yet, to my knowledge, by the Suffolk County Police Department, 
are the two or three 911 calls that Joseph Brewer made the next day. Yeah. So we can't talk about those as of yet. If that ever does change, um, you all will be the first to hear about it. We'll discuss what's on there. But um, I don't know. Maybe we'll do another uh, follow-up episode on this. Maybe after we release this, Michael, if you want, maybe we could open this up to the listeners of Unresolved and do maybe a Q&A episode. Like, listeners, yeah. uh, if, th- if this makes it in... Uh, Unresolved is on a wide variety of social networks. Uh, if you're not already aware and following, uh, Unresolved has pages on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, there is also a Reddit page for the Unresolved podcast. If you have a question about our work on the 911 recordings in the Shannon Gilbert case, whether it's the technical work we did or if you just want to ask what we think about what's on those tapes, mm-hmm. drop a line on there and we'll do a follow-up yeah. episode in the future. But uh, before we do go, Michael, general impressions of the recording um, after finally getting to listen to it after, see, this was 2020, after five years of covering this story on Unresolved, what what were your initial impressions? <sighs> yeah, I don't even know. I just remember... The first time that I heard it, I remember when you uh, basically sent me the link, um, just thinking, I don't know, just like an overwhelming sadness, Mm. because I'm sure you are, you are already aware of this, but like when you research these stories, like you spend so many hours just researching like the personal details of someone and it feels like you almost like you, you don't know them, but it feels like you almost kind of know them on a different level. Yeah. But, you know, just getting to hear what were some of probably her final minutes alive and just hearing her state of mind. Like I just remember just an overwhelming sadness. That's the only way I could really describe it. What about you? Um, it was a mixture of several different waves of emotion. Uh, it was the feeling of, Oh my God, I'm actually going to hear these tapes that I've been reading about for 10 it was 10 years by this point yeah just about and and i I mean if the listeners if 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 you've been following unresolved's coverage of this and you know you heard our interview with author robert kolker you know that michael and i have read that book several times it is one of the not just one of the greatest true crime books ever written. I I think it's one of the best books I've ever read in general, especially with how it chronicles the investigation and, and uh, humanizes the victims in this case, which are largely tossed aside by society. You know, there's the famous terminology for it, the less dead sex workers just aren't cared about the way other victims of violent crime are. So, Knowing that this huge part of the lore, these tapes, like at one point, John Ray told me, he goes, I didn't even know if these things existed anymore. Maybe that's why they were stalling for so long. They didn't want the public to know that either it wasn't recorded or they had lost the recording. Yeah, that's what I actually thought for a hot minute. I thought they had like bungled the recordings or lost it on threw away some hard drive or something, but. Yeah, or of course, you know, if you want to go into the conspiracy mindset of it, that they were deliberately destroyed. Um, um, and I think I even joked during our our interview with Bob Kolker that, you know, again, they're not being released because James Burke's on them. Well, we know now that he wasn't. He wasn't mm-hmm. named on it. We don't hear his voice on it at all. It had nothing really to do with that. But just knowing, like, oh, my God, am I about to find out why They've been repressed for all these years. And then it was once I hit play, it was the overwhelming dread and sorrow of, oh, man, I'm about to listen to the, as you said, the final moments of this poor young woman. And the police department had been saying for years that. You know, it was this panicked, incoherent phone call and, you know, she didn't make sense on the recordings and she couldn't tell us where she was. 
And the dread kind of came in of, oh, am I about to listen to something really disturbing? Yeah. And I mean, of course, there are parts of the tape that are, but I was mm-hmm. struck by how calm and coherent she was through the majority of the tape. She definitely had like moments where you could tell that she, I don't know, there were like moments where you could hear that Joseph Brewer was talking to her and just like, what are you talking about? And it seemed like she, you know, there were moments where she might have been maybe less than lucid. But uh, yeah, it's just throughout most of it, like she makes a surprising amount of sense. Like she's just trying to figure out what's going on. Well, yeah, she's clearly afraid of leaving the house and getting in the car with Michael Pack. Yeah. And the first thing that happens when she does finally leave that house is Michael Pack. We can only assume it's Michael Pack. Um, grabs her, and you hear a, a struggle and a scuffle, possibly an assault of some sort. We do know that her jacket was torn from her body and an earring mm-hmm. was ripped out. Those items were found in Brewer's driveway a couple days later when the police and the family came. But yeah. we now know why. And Michael Pack has never admitted to this in any of his police interviews or his depositions or his public interviews. He was interviewed mm-hmm. on film by A&E for a documentary back in 2011. And never once did he say, oh, yeah, when she got out of the house, you know, I tried grabbing onto her to get her in the car or, yeah, we had a scuffle or anything. You can clearly hear this on the tapes. But he's always said, oh, no, uh, I was just sitting there waiting for her. And then she just ran past the car and I immediately turned on the car and followed her and I was shouting her name while following behind her. Mm -hmm. And you hear none of that on the tape. Yeah. They have a scuffle, a a struggle, whatever you want to call it. She breaks free and she runs away. And for the final, I want to say maybe eight or nine minutes of the tape, however long it is, you never hear his car start up. You never hear him shouting her name. And you certainly don't hear him following her. So that was what was very surprising to me. It was just, wow, we've never been told the truth about this portion of the tape. And I'm honestly surprised that a lot more, I mean, frankly, I didn't see any other media organization pick up on that. Like, Hey, you know, she's scared of leaving this house. She's afraid of what's going to happen to her. What's the first thing that happened when she happens, when she leaves the house, she's attacked, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it was his desperate attempt to get her in the car or it was something else. Either way, there was a physical confrontation, and we were never told this happened on the tapes. I don't know no. why more news organizations didn't publicly question, hey, why did the Suffolk County Police Department not tell the truth about this? And more importantly, why did Michael Pack not tell the truth about this? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's just kind of frustrating, the the entire reporting of the story. It just it's upset me pretty much from the get-go, and that's... I I personally credit this story and like Bob Colker's book Lost Girls with kind of like changing how I approach this podcast because I noticed that a lot of the reporting of like Shannon Gilbert, you know, like, oh, she's just, you know, basically a sex worker that got lost in the marsh and drowned. And it's like there is a lot more to her story than that. And I really hate that a lot of people, you know, will latch on to specific details and just stick with them. There is a lot more to the story and a lot of it doesn't make sense. Like uh, one portion of the lore that is ever present in this story is oh it took the police hours to respond and that's why she was never found and saved and that's just not true we now know from the timestamps that are encoded on these tapes and from police records that it only took the suffolk county police department i want to say maybe 17 minutes after her uh, her final 911 call ended. Mm-hmm. Or, no, I think the final one that was called in was Barbara Brennan's that morning, and you hear Shannon pounding on the door demanding to be let in in the background, and that's the last known recording we have of her. So there is only something like 17 minutes 
Well, how, if we do the follow up episode, I'll I'll make sure to have the uh, the notes in front of me on this. So please forgive me for using approximations here, but it's definitely significantly less than an hour between when mm-hmm. she's last heard on Barbara Brennan's nine one one call and when the cops showed up. So much so, and I noted this in the report, the analysis report that we submitted to John Ray's office, that the police would have been there while Shannon was still, if she voluntarily went into the marsh, because that is up for debate. But if she did voluntarily go in there and she was panicking and screaming and trying to find her way out of there, the way that the Suffolk County police department has theorized over the years, the cops would have been in that neighborhood and heard it. It's just really, really sad. And it makes no sense whatsoever. It makes absolutely none. That's why I do believe in the possibility that she was brought into a home or a vehicle at the very least. picked up by someone, yeah. Yeah, in between, in those 17 minutes, between um, her last being heard on Barbara Brennan's 911 call and the police showing up. Because if she truly was panicking and running through that marsh and screaming, an officer would have heard it. And, mm-hmm. and no officer reported hearing such. And there is video out there of John Ray and assistance from his office standing in the marsh in the exact spot where Shannon's body was located. And you're in complete visible distance of the nearest house. You can see the dining room table through the window nearby. So the idea that, you know, she panicked and fled into the marsh and got lost and gave up and could because she couldn't find the road and somehow drowned lying face up in less than half an inch of water. It makes yeah. no sense to me. It makes Yeah, that's another none. thing that has always kind of stuck with me about the reporting. But it seems like a lot of people just write off her death as like, oh yeah, she just went out and drowned. You know, she was high on cocaine and like came down really hard because of her mental issues and like that is that. But it's like mm-hmm. if you just look at the details at face value, like Nothing about her death really makes sense. (laughs) She had gone out there, you know, like you said, there was less than an inch of water in the marsh. So we're not talking about like a swamp. She didn't fall into like this big pit of mud or something. Because, yeah, we mentioned that in the final analytical report that we provided to John Ray's office. We looked into the tides that day. There, there, The tide was only up by half an inch. There was no rain that morning. It was after 5 a.m. going very close to 6 a.m. The sun was rising. Yeah, it, you know, and it was, it was like, what, May or April of 2010? May 3rd. Yeah, May, May 3rd. 3rd. Yeah. It was 55 degrees out. Yeah, so she this wasn't like the death. middle of winter. There wasn't like snow on the ground or anything like that. This was like the, the weather outside was really nice. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just... I w- at one point on the tape when she's banging on the, on uh, Gus Coletti's door, you can hear birds chirping and, you know, the, the birds you hear at sunrise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it was not. It, when you watch these reenactments on some of these true crime television shows, they always go for the moody look where, oh, my God, she's running through the reeds and it's pitch black out. And, yeah, the reeds were tall, but again, the sun was rising and you could see. You know, you were so close to that house, and mm-hmm. I think she was only like less than 150 feet from the road. Like, yeah, something like that. Like, yeah, her remains weren't found like very far at all. So, yeah, it makes like, you no have, sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. The only thing that really makes sense to me is if you know someone followed her out there, or then took her remains out there afterward. And that's you know, even that is just kind of like a lot of people are going to think that's like conspiratorial thinking, but that's really all I could think of. Cause the- no, if you want to really, if you really want to get into conspiratorial thinking, we could go into how uh, bizarre it is that half of her clothing and um, her pocketbook, her phone and her money were found a um, hundred feet away, a uh, hundred feet behind Charles Hackett's house. Yeah. You know, we could go into that. You know, the police didn't uh, mention that during the press conference, you know, they, they just played it up as well. Uh, we understand that she was a drug user and had a history of mental illness and episodes like this. So that's what explains it. But the mm-hmm. autopsy report, and I'm not talking about the one that the family commissioned through Dr. Michael Bodden. I'm talking about the official toxicology report from the Suffolk County Police Department. They tested her hair for cocaine use. Guess what? It came back negative. 
Mm -hmm. So whatever, if she was on anything that night, it was something that was very new to her because they, you know, you can, you can trace drug use back. I mean, months, if not years in long hair, they found Mm -hmm. none of it in her toxic, in her toxicology report. They also, um, didn't acknowledge the fact that the Gilbert family has made several public statements saying that the idea that Shannon had these um, bipolar freakouts where she didn't know where she was and was combative and violent. I mean, Cherie Gilbert, her own sister, told me personally, Shannon never had episodes like that. She does not know how that myth got out there. So, I'm inclined to take the family's word here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, you know, personal, I personally believe Cherie Gilbert in this case. She has not sought out the limelight. She is a mom trying to raise her kids and doing so now with her mother is murdered, her sister is dead, and her other sister that committed this murder is now in a, a I believe a federal prison either way she's mm-hmm. she's not going anywhere yeah she's out of the picture for her life pretty much for the rest of it it's yeah really sad and yeah. I'm sure you know she's you know still involved in in some manner you know it's a family member that's incarcerated um you know, again, the, the movies that have been made, she had nothing to do with those. She had no idea that that um, Lifetime movie, the, Shan- the was it the Shannon Gilbert story or was it the Marie Gilbert story? The one that came out last year? Oh, I don't even know. I, I, the only one terrible. I know of is the adaptation of Lost Girls, which I still haven't seen. It's okay. It's okay. You know, yeah. It's it's not. It's not Zodiac. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, nothing uh, is, but <laughs> it's a hell of a lot better than that piece of shit Lifetime TV Ugh. movie they made. Oh, my God. Talk about coming soon to True Crime Movie Club, people. <laughs> that movie is just, oh, my God, it's just total dog shit. And she said, oh, yeah, you know, I was never no one ever called me to consult mm-hmm. with me about my sister on that or my mother. So, um. Yeah, it's oh God. There are few families in the world that have gone through what the Gilbert family has gone through in the last 10 years. Oh, it's just really sad. Like every time we start talking about this story, I just end up getting kind of like angry at the world just because it seems yeah. like when bad things happen, they tend to happen to the wrong people. It really sucks. And, you know, largely there are no real answers that come about. Um, Through the release of these tapes, um, it was our opinion when we analyzed them that these tapes had not been uh, tampered with. We could find no edit points in it Mm -hmm. or anything like that. So it doesn't seem like there were answers um, that that, that had been eliminated deliberately. Uh, Well, the the time stamps on everything, because, again, there were other calls we could compare it to. It all lined up there. So, yeah, it was unfortunately just another frustrating dead end. Do, does it shine light on the fact that the Suffolk County Police Department has not been honest about the contents of that tape? Sure. Does it um, shine a light on the fact that Joseph Brewer and Michael Pack have not been honest about their uh, versions of what happened that night because we now know what's on the tapes? Sure, but nothing's really being done about it. Yeah. I mean, if they've been re-interviewed by the police, I mean, I haven't heard about it. I I do think that they should be held accountable somewhat, especially if, you know, it's bad enough Pack abandoned her out there when she ran off instead of, you know, contacting someone that could have helped. But the fact that there may have been an assault there, I mean, that's pretty significant. I mean, Mm -hmm. it shows that she had reason to fear leaving that house that night. Now, am I saying that Michael Pack killed her? Of course not. Am I saying that Mm -hmm. Michael Pack is the Long Island serial killer? Get real. But I do think it does bear questioning why these two people, Pack and Brewer, have not been honest about that night for all these years. Yeah, and why they've basically been avoiding all like public interviews and stuff since 2011 or thereabouts. I don't think any Mm -hmm. of them have spoken to anyone you know they pretty much shut down everything it's just yeah yeah no the the last interview with brewer that 
I am aware of is the one that appears in uh, Coker's book Lost Girls, and there's a whole chapter on that bizarre encounter. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of a shame, just because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like Shan... I'm trying to articulate like a bunch of thoughts at once, but for me, it's just really sad that as of now, Shannon Gilbert's death is still listed as misadventure. And uh, it seems like, yeah, with the release of this audio, like Suffolk County is almost like washing their hands of her. Like they're pretty much just like done. Like, oh yeah, she died. Here's the audio. We're done. Mm. It just seems like they're checking out and uh, you know, her and her family deserve a lot better than that. Yeah. And I mean, as I said before, it, it's nonsensical. They're writing death by misadventure because they don't have an answer for anything else. You know, mm-hmm. despite the fact that her hyoid bone was broken in the spot where it breaks when you're strangled to death. Yeah. Um, she was found facing up, not just facing up, but I can't name who told me this, but I, I have been in contact with someone who, how can I word this without getting them in trouble? I am in contact with someone who can speak authoritatively on this. And what they told me is not only was she found face up, but she was practically leaning, like sitting up against a bush. Oh, wow. And that's why if you read her autopsy report that's out there, which is very surprisingly vague. I mean, Michael, you and I read autopsy reports for a living and they will, if they're doing their job right, they tell you a body was found in this position and this location, yeah. yada, yada, yada. It just says body found in a marsh. Wow. But if, if you, if you look closely at the autopsy report, it, there are some things written in there that seem to validate the story that she was found sitting up in a, you know, position of leaning mm-hmm. against the bush. And one of them is that, Her leg bones were stained brown from the mud, but all of her skeleton above her waist was bleached white by the sun. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know that. That's And again, the autopsy report has been made public, so we're we're not violating the confidentiality uh, confidentiality agreement by uh, talking about that. But yeah, things like that. Unfortunately, with... Just like with a lot of the other cases that are chronicled here on Unresolved, um, one question answered opens the door for a dozen others. And I really do hope uh, we get answers uh, in our lifetimes, especially in the lifetimes of the the victims' families, of course. But... uh, Yeah, hopefully we'll get there. I'll be very surprised. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm a perpetual optimist, and uh, I-, I remember a couple months before the Golden State Killer was identified, someone asked me if they thought he would ever be found, and I-, I answered pretty honestly. I said, yeah, with the advancements in you know DNA testing and stuff, I'm pretty sure we're close. But uh, that was at around the same time that I was talking to uh, a U.S. Marshal, and he was talking about how he had recommended using the genealogical websites to catch April Tinsley's killer. And that ended up, you know, coming to fruition months later. But, uh, you know, I I still kind of have that feeling about the Long Island serial killer. I have a feeling that he's still going to get caught. Um, You know, Suffolk County has been withholding so many details about this case. I just have to hope that there's, you know, some evidence of some sort that will hopefully lead to the killer being identified. Um, I don't Mm. know. Personally, I think that's all we can do. We can just hope and I guess... I don't want to say pray, but just hope and pray that someone out there is doing something and knows what they're doing. Yeah, hopefully. Um, yeah. I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, <laughs> guess I'll agree with that. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll put it that way. Stranger things have happened. Um, you know, last Friday they finally solved the Princess Doe case, and I never thought in a million years that was going to be solved. Yeah. Um. As much as I wanted it to be, I'd been covering that case for Weird New Jersey Magazine for about a decade now. Yeah, Um, wrote some great articles about it, that's for sure. Well, thank you. Um, Your check is in the mail. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, uh, that is how Michael and I came to be involved in one of the most controversial and well-known cold cases in American history, certainly modern history. Yeah. And surprise, surprise, it had to do with me digging my nose into, (laughs) into someone else's business with this, to be fair. But again, I wanted to help. Hopefully 
we did help in some way. I know the Gilbert family appreciates the work that we did. Uh, again, I, I've been in contact with Cherie Gilbert about the developments in this case. And Cherie, if you're listening, I hope I am proven wrong very soon. Yeah. And the answers will come uh, one day for this case. Whether Shannon was a victim of the Long Island serial killer or not is irrelevant. Um, she ended up in that marsh, and no one knows how. Mm -hmm. There need to be answers, and I personally think the Suffolk County Police Department is failing the Gilbert family in finding answers here. For whatever yeah. reason, whether it's incompetence, indifference, or your favorite conspiracy theory of the week... The Suffolk County Police Department does not seem very interested in figuring out what the hell happened on um, the morning of May 3rd, 2010. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just really sad. You know, Shannon and pretty much everyone else involved in this case, they deserve better than they've gotten. And uh, I don't know, I guess we could just only hope that continued awareness of the story keeps people engaged and angry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but yeah but we just wanted to record you know this little episode kind of clear the air we kind of left things off in our last conversation saying we were going to talk again and it's been a couple months but we just wanted to we had the opportunity to chat and we figured you know might as well just talk about it a little bit yeah i mean again we haven't really revealed anything groundbreaking, but we said we would be transparent and it took us a little bit, but we appreciate you all being uh, patient with us. Yeah. And again, if there's anything that you all want to know about us and our involvement in cleaning these tapes up, transcribing them and preparing the final reports for John Ray and the Gilbert family, Reach out to Michael on the many unresolved social media accounts. And um, if it's yep. stuff that we can address, we will definitely do a follow up episode. And again, if for some reason you are still listening to this and you have not listened to Michael's original <laughs> coverage of the Long Island serial killer case, please stop what you are doing and listen to not just a three part series but the follow-up episodes he has done since. It is arguably some of the best podcast coverage of this story. A lot of podcasts. Uh, you're too kind. Hey, I hang out with you for a reason. I'm a busy man. <laughs> but I got time yeah. for you, Michael. Because again, this coverage, a lot of podcasts uh, try covering this case. Few do it well unresolved is one of them so definitely go check those episodes out if you haven't already well i appreciate it and uh, everyone make sure to go follow jesse on all of the socials you know he's a lot more active there than i am so leave me alone <laughs> hey you no. will be informed no, and entertained he is very funny <laughs> so uh, yeah just do that <laughs> yeah, and and if anyone thinks that that I don't take these these cases seriously because I, I'm sarcastic oh, yeah. and I crack a joke here, I'm I'm from New Jersey. I can't help it, but I do have nothing but respect for the people involved in these stories. And even though I'm a bit of a wise ass, I saw an opportunity to help out a family in need, and it just happened to be this one. So hopefully, answers will be coming. Yeah, and I will say that I always have a tendency to joke with you just because, you know, it, it's kind of hard not to. But uh, if you're out there and you are interested in following any jo any of Jesse's work, uh, make sure to check out the documentary feature that he's putting out called The Acid King. He's also released a couple books, The Acid King and Death on the Devil's Teeth, which you have a revised version coming out, which I'm very excited about. He, we'll be able to talk about finally once that book is out we'll finally be able to talk about the De Palma case on Unresolved. I remember yeah. Michael had asked me all the way back in 2018 if um we should do an episode on it and i said just wait i said there's yeah. there's important stuff that the public doesn't know about this case yet and i can't talk about it until the book is out and that day is finally coming it'll be out the uh third or fourth week of september i think it's september 20 Seventh, I think I, I, I'm sorry mm -hmm. the the release date has changed a few times, but yeah, if you follow me at J Pollock author, that's J P O L L A C K, you will get the release dates on these projects along with um, memes that I find while I am doom scrolling <laughs> and the occasional snarky tweet. 
Um, <laughs> also, possibly my stoned opinions on Star Wars and horror movies. So, yeah, if you like that, um, definitely give me a, a follow. And if you don't, I'm sure I'll see you in the YouTube comments bitching about me. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'll just disable the comments for this one. Don't, but, uh, <laughs> don't do no. Then they'll, they'll then they'll just cancel your patri their Patreon uh, subscription. <laughs> M- Michael, I thought you believed in free speech. <laughs> oh God, don't even get me started. Anyways, <laughs> thanks for coming on, Jesse. We appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure we'll be chatting again about some other stories in the near future. Yeah, um, that may be a hint for a project we're working chat. on. <laughs> oh yeah yeah we we gotta talk about that stuff and um and it, it, if you do want to hear a humorous spin of course we're not making fun of um victims of violent crime at all but if you want to hear michael and i make fun of terrible movies that exploit the victims mm-hmm. of violent crime definitely check out the true crime movie club podcast where we review and roast the worst true crime movies that um, society has to offer, <laughs> unfortunately, of which there are many. And um, yeah, too many. Some of the cases and stories that have been um, featured here on Unresolved have also been discussed on another podcast that we're both a part of. That's Podcast 1289. Um, we've done Mothman episodes, uh, Grave Robbing for Morons, um, some Zodiac episodes. Um, if you like last podcast on the left and, you know, you like last jokes. podcast on the left, but you like it to be about weird conspiracy theories and Bigfoot and stuff like that. Check yeah, out like, podcast 1289. <laughs> yeah. Like we did an episode on a guy in Florida who's convinced Stephen King killed John Lennon. Like that's the kind of stuff you're going to find there. But if you check us out, don't start at the beginning. We used to record with a Skype recorder and it sucked. Just, just pick whatever topic you like and start yeah. there. It's. It's not the That's Star usually what Wars I say about universe. Unresolved too. <laughs> no, no, I like yeah. the. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna call your some of your audience out here for a minute here. I see some of you all complaining to Michael that there's too much music or the music is too loud. I like the music in those early episodes. Unresolved, it's yeah, creepy. That's, that's why I put it on there. I like the you know the the theater of the mind type radio, and uh, I've kind of gotten away from that. Just trying to report facts, but uh. I might go back to that in the near future. I like that. Go back to ambient it, man. music, yeah. Man, like no one else was doing that at the time. Like I, I ripped off that shit for the Devil's Teeth. Po- <laughs> you want to hear someone that that really has reverence for what Michael does with his true crime reporting? Go listen to the Devil's Teeth podcast and listen to me actually talk seriously for a minute. It is possible, <laughs> folks. <laughs> So oh, yeah, a, yeah. A, enough goofing around. We're talking yeah. about heinous things, but yeah, um, follow the uh, various unresolved accounts we mentioned. If you want to check out our side projects, they're all there too. And mm-hmm. uh, as always, you know, despite our jokes, we appreciate each and every one of you that tuned in this week. And yep. again, if yeah. you have any questions, just let us know on the World Wide Web. Thanks for listening, everyone. I should be back with another regular episode next weekend, but thank you all for your patience as I try and figure out some things in my own life. Trying to work on a podcast like this as a full-time father has been complicated enough for the past year, but I've had some other stuff pile on top of that for the past few weeks. My wife's work in the military, another COVID outbreak in our home, yet another move, some other personal issues, dealing with burnout. It's just been incredibly stressful and hectic, so thank you all for your continued patience and support. Take care, everyone. Talk to you soon.